wonderful to be here. More wonderful if we could hear. Good. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And I'm going to be sharing a few words before I read the scripture, so the video person may want to know that. Uh, uh, I want to begin today by thanking your senior pastor, Sam Powers, who's been a colleague and a friend to me for, for many years, and of course, the leadership of your United Methodist Women for the invitation to preach here in this beautiful sanctuary among such wonderful people uh, today. And uh, as a district superintendent for our bishop, it's my privilege always to bring greetings to you from Bishop Robert E. Hayes, Jr., and warm regards uh, to you and thanksgiving for your church uh, and your faithfulness as individuals and as well as, as a congregation. Our text today comes to us from what has been called and is called the letter of James. It's really not a letter. It's really a sermon uh, given by a pastor to his congregation. Uh, and it's, it's intended just to be uh, shared with one congregation. Uh, letters in the scripture are often thought of as those who are, that are passed from congregation to congregation uh, for the purpose of educating uh, all of Christendom. Uh, in James's case, he was uh, writing to his own congregation uh, and to only them to give them some advice about being Christians and how to live in the world as followers of Jesus. Today we're going to be addressing the fifth chapter, the last chapter uh, of uh, this text, and the final seven verses of James's sermon. I know that in the weeks previous to this, your senior pastor has been addressing the chapters prior to this in the book of James, so that uh, you have been well, uh, well preached to in regards to this text. Um, one of the things I noticed in... in preaching on this particular text is that um, our brother James is a remarkable preacher and uh, that he knows how to end a sermon well. Not all of us do, uh, but he does. Sometimes I know that anyone in the pew knows that there are some of us preachers who end our sermons many times during the sermon. <laughs> right? Right? And if I start to do that, all you have to do is this to me, okay? But what James did, what James did is what I think most people yearn for when we go to hear a sermon. Um, most of us want to get a sense that the preacher uh, understands us and the lives that we live and that the preacher uh, is invested in uh, letting us know how best we might live those lives as followers of Jesus. And so giving us direction and guidance in our Christian walk. James does exactly that beautifully in these last verses of his sermon from the fifth chapter, uh, verses 13 to 20. Let's listen now uh, to uh, one of our earliest pastors in the Christian church. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if any among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save that sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, be in my thoughts, my words, and in all of our considerations of your holy scripture and of how we might best live as your disciples, Lord Jesus. May we please you in these moments of worship, and may we please you as we take our worship into the world that you love. Amen. All right. Of the many things that James instructed his congregation to do as he concluded his sermon, one of the main things that he said was that we ought to confess our sin to one another. We've all heard that confession is good for the soul, right? And that when we carry around the burden of sin, it's a heavy burden. And most of us, because we've had enough practice, know that if we confess our sin, that burden can be lightened for us. So I thought it might be good for us to take James's instruction today seriously in the congregation. And I thought, well, all I need to do is ask you to turn to one of your neighbors, right or left, doesn't matter, and confess your sin. And this is how the other two congregations responded to my suggestion. Okay. Looks like I have my work cut out for me. I guess I'll have to make myself an example for you and confess my own sin. Uh, a few months back when your senior pastor, Sam, uh, called me to ask me if I would be able uh, and willing to come and preach for this Sunday, uh, I must confess, or I'm going to choose to confess, that my first thoughts were not all that Christ-like. Um, preachers are just like everybody else. You know, I, I, I'll bet when your organist... I bet when you hear another organist, you compare yourself and that person's skills, right? Uh, you know, whatever we do, whoever we are, we, we compare ourselves to people who do what we do or who like what we like or all those kinds of things. So preachers, we, we compare ourselves to each other. You better believe it. And I have actually been in this sanctuary uh, in the pew, and I have listened uh, and watched your, listened to and watched your preacher preach. So uh, I know a little about, and, and I've heard him preach before, and, and I know a little about Sam's preaching, and I thought to myself, oh man, he's so good, and here am I, oh gee, and uh, so then I thought about it a little more, and uh, here's the things that I was thinking, I, I really hope I hope to be forgiven. Your preacher is what is technically in the world of the church called a walk-around preacher. Because he walks around. He, doesn't he? He comes down here, he walks around, right? He's a walk-around preacher. Walk-around preachers do that. They walk around and they have all these wise things to say while they walk around. And then they have stories that fit all their great wisdom. And they remember all the points of the story. And they tell the whole story without, without pausing, without even looking at a note. That's what walk around preachers do. They even make several, sometimes they make more than three points in their sermon and do them in order without looking at a note. And you, my friends, have the best walk-around preacher in our annual conference as your senior pastor. Yeah, you do. You do. You do. So when Sam called me, I was a little bit intimidated because guess what? I am a 
pulpit <laughs> preacher. I started preaching a long time before him, by the way. He's a little younger. And back then, that's what we did, and I got to liken it. I like to preach behind a pulpit. The bigger the pulpit, the better. The more shelves that you should never see back here, they are so messy. There's stuff back here that's been here since 1969. <laughs> I like to look at those shelves and know you can't see them. I have every note possible in front of me for my sermon because that's how I preach. So you can imagine that I was just a little bit intimidated coming to this sanctuary to follow your preacher who, by the way, if you're looking for him, he's hiding right up there in the corner <laughs> there. So those of you right here, get a spitball, you know who it came from. But when Sam kept talking to me about coming to preach, the thing that he did was he let the Holy Spirit tell him what to say. And at one point he said, well, Tish, it's United Methodist Women's Sunday. So we really would like for you to come. And I thought, I have been a minister ordained for more than 30 years. I have never missed preaching a United Methodist Women's Sunday in all those 30 years somewhere. So I guess this year it's here. So I said yes, and here I am. And uh, I'm delighted to be here because I believe the United Methodist Women are now and have always been some of the greatest movers or shakers of our denomination. They are not just ladies who lunch. They are not. And they have kept our church honest for many years and challenged us with some of the most, uh, in some of the most remarkable ways with uh, edge issues for the church uh, and our society. For more than 30 years, it's, it's been my life, it's been my identity to uh, be a person who lifts up uh, those who are led by God in this world, some of whom follow Jesus. And in those years, alongside many of you, I have witnessed some amazing things happen in our United Methodist Church, most often deeply led by the United Methodist Women, one of which for me, in my lifetime, I have experienced, and in some of your lifetimes, who you have hair this color, you have also witnessed our church having the full inclusion of women in our leadership, all the way to our bishops in our lifetime. I was in the first service earlier today, and of course it's United Methodist Women's Sunday, but still we had girls acolyting, we had girls doing all kinds of leadership, women doing all kinds of leadership. This is something that is new within the last 30 years in our church, and in great part because of the, the leadership of our United Methodist Women. And in those years, I've also witnessed um, our church, our United Methodist Church, and I'm sure many of you have too, finding ways to reach out to the poor, to those who are suffering in many ways, and especially to those who Jesus would eagerly and earnestly reach out to, those who in the world have been untouchable. People who suffer from HIV and AIDS, people who suffer from leprosy, and the United Methodist church, through the work of the United Methodist Women in great part, has responded to those needs and so many others in real deep and significant ways in regards to HIV and AIDS on the continent of Africa. Our church has many, many places of care where people can receive medical care, but also when people pass from HIV or AIDS, or and AIDS, uh, many times there are families left behind. And on that continent, we find many orphans 
uh, who don't have people to raise them. And so our United Methodist Churches, through the Methodist women of our expressions in Africa, have opened many orphanages and not only opened them, but have moved into those places to raise those children as their own because they are our own. Great, great and wondrous things. Throughout the history of our church to this very day, uh, the United Methodist Church has challenged our congregations, but not only our congregations. We also challenge uh, many governments and societies by speaking what uh, is often considered or experienced as an uncomfortable truth, the uncomfortable truth of Jesus Christ. And we speak that uncomfortable truth to power in many places in the world. We speak that uncomfortable truth to power in our own uh, United States Congress and Senate. We speak that uncomfortable truth to power in war-torn villages and communities all over the world, as well as to the General Assembly of the United Nations where our United Methodist women built a beautiful sanctuary celebrating all of the religions of the world in the United Nations. And our United Methodist women sustain that chapel, that sanctuary for the people of God who visit that remarkable place in our country. Many things that they have done have made a great and wondrous difference, and I know that will continue. Every four years in our United Methodist Church, a global assembly comes together called the General Conference, and your senior pastor will be a representative of our area at the General Conference this year uh, in Portland, Oregon. At that place, uh, people from all over the world who call themselves Methodists discern, pray about, and work together to try to understand what is God's law for the people called Methodist? What is God's vision for the people called Methodist into the future? And what are the social principles by which we all over the world shall live not only together, but with all people of all faiths and understandings. From Moscow to Seoul to Cape Town to right here in Edmond, when the General Conference speaks, we will all, all over the world, respond as the great church that we are. But we are not the only tribe included in the body of Jesus Christ in the world. We celebrate that we are one of many tribes of Christians around the world. And didn't we celebrate that beautifully, or haven't we celebrated that beautifully in this last week in our country as we've experienced the Pope, Pope Francis, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, living amongst us here in the United States for this week. What a remarkable experience. And I imagine that whatever your politics is, that like me, you were probably deeply moved, I certainly was, deeply moved by the whispered request of Pope Francis when he leaned to the air of our Speaker of the House of Representatives, John Boehner, and he asked him to pray for him. John Boehner was also moved by that request. And the Pope didn't just ask him to pray for him, but he asked a classroom of children to keep him in his, their prayers. He asked a group of homeless women and men and children while he shared lunch with them, if they would pray for him. 
He asked them to pray for him. One of the most influential people in the entire world asked both people of power and people who yearn for some power to pray for him. And today, I, I want to speak with you about just that, about what prayer is and about specifically powerful and effective prayer. Prayer that James told his congregation to continue in doing as he concluded his sermon. Prayer that heals us. Prayer that helps us through the days. Prayer that challenges and changes not only us, but also the world that God loves for the better. Prayer that we cry out when we're in trouble. And prayer that we sing when we feel just plain joyful. All of this prayer is powerful and it's effective. There are prayers that are almost inaudible because we pray them through our tears as we confess our sin to God and to one another. And those prayers are powerful and effective enough to forgive absolutely anything you or I have ever done. Prayer. The writer of the message, which is a uh, paraphrase of the Bible, Eugene Peterson, called this kind of prayer, I just love what he said, he, he called this prayer to be reckoned with. Prayer to be reckoned with. That is powerful. That is effective prayer. It has absolutely nothing to do with much of the prayer we and I, I would conclude myself, we might say most often. The prayers where we give God our to-do list. Things we want God to do for us and for others. While those are important prayers, that's not what we're talking about here. We are not talking here about, or I am not talking here, about prayers that uh, remind God of when and how and what to do. Those prayers, too, have their place. But I'm talking about another kind of prayer here. Prayer that's powerful and prayer that is effective changes us so that we may change the world God loves. Prayer that's powerful and prayer that is effective brings us closer to God and to each other. It's been all over the... Over, I almost did it. I, well, I'll do it anyway. My kids laugh at me because I say, the Facebook it's been all over, I'm supposed to say Facebook. It's been all over Facebook that uh, Pope Francis uh, said about prayer. He said many things about prayer, but this is one thing that has uh, connected to many of us. You pray for the hungry, then you feed them. That's how prayer works. That's how prayer works, friends. You pray, then you do it. That's how prayer works. That's powerful and effective prayer. You don't do it by yourself. Certainly, the power to accomplish greatness in even the smallest things comes to us as a gift from God. But you pray for something, and then you do it. That's how it works. You know, we know that Jesus had followers disciples who were men, right? We all know that. But Jesus also had disciples and followers who were women. It's less well known, but it is true. And you can find some of their names in the Bible. And we know that women had significant roles in the leadership of the earliest church after the resurrection of Jesus. 
And we know that when the Orthodox and when the Roman Catholic churches, when they uh, began to take or remove from the, from the possibility of their lives the empowerment of women in congregations and in whole uh, communities of faith, women just did what women have been doing forever in their congregations, in their communities, in their families, in their convents, women still kept on running things. Can I get a witness? <laughs> You're not going to stop us. Good grief. Well, anyway, that happened in our history. <laughs> and our own United Methodist women are the daughters and the granddaughters and the great-granddaughters of a long line of a heritage of women who developed what we called women's missionary societies. And uh, for our own United Methodist women, two women's missionary societies uh, came together uh, after our churches, the church, the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren Church unified to become the United Methodist Church in 1968 the uh, women, the women's missionary societies of those two uh, separate denominations took five years and in 1973 they became the United Methodist Women. One organization, one church. Well, they knew then and we know now that they stand and we stand on the shoulders, they stood and we stand on the shoulders of many many who've gone before us. In fact, uh, it was just a small group of women, six, six women in 1869, who got together on a very stormy day in the living room of a woman in Boston, Massachusetts. And they got together because they were going to pray with each other, and they were going to learn from two women who had just come to back to the United States from India where their husbands were missionaries. And these two women, Mrs. William Butler and Mrs. Uh, Edwin Parker, uh, began to visit with this group of six women who got together through the storm, prayed with each other, and then Mrs. Parker and Mrs. Butler began to share about the troubles of girls and women in India that they had learned about. Mrs. Butler and Mrs. Parker told those six women that they had learned uh, while they'd been in India that uh, it was unacceptable for male doctors to treat uh, girls and women uh, in that culture at that time. And uh, that as far as they knew, then girls and women were not cared for by physicians at all because they didn't know of any female doctors uh, treating uh, girls and women. So that was a big problem. And then they said, and, you know, in addition to that, most girls uh, are not allowed to go to school, and, and, and women are not as well, uh, at that time and in that culture. And um, uh, so there isn't the potential for teaching them how to care for one another, which is another underlying problem that they wanted to share uh, with women in the United States, not just to talk about, and not just to pray about, but to do something about. Can you imagine this? I mean, think about it. You're probably going to go to lunch after this. You might have six people around the table. What if two people came and sat with you and said, by the way, there's a problem thousands of miles from here and um, we want to tell you about it, and we want to pray with you about it, then we want you to make a difference for the people there. Quite a challenge. But let me tell you something, friends. Those women were up to the challenge. And, and, and I want to make sure we're, we understand what I said early on in the story. The missionaries were... Um, Mrs. Butler and Mrs. Parker's husbands. Okay? They, they, Mrs. Butler and Mrs. Parker were not considered to be missionaries. I'm going to let that sink in. Well, let me tell you what they did. 
they had another meeting because they were Methodists. <laughs> but they got something done at their second meeting because they were United Methodist women. At the second meeting, they wrote and they ratified the uh, constitution of the Methodist Women's Foreign Missionary Society. And from that time till before 1869 was over, they never even made it to 1870 before they raised all of the money. They found a female doctor. They found a woman educator. Uh, they funded their transport. They purchased a place for them to live and work and funded their mission work completely. They sent Dr. Clara Swain and Ms. Isabella Thoburn to India to make a difference on their behalf because they were Christian people. And I can tell you for a fact that they got it done because a few years ago I had the blessing of leading a mission team from Oklahoma to India and we stayed in one of the girls' homes and schools established by Dr. Swain and Isabella Thogren. Prayer. Prayer. <laughs> that is powerful and is effective. Now, I asked you a minute ago, you know, can you imagine, uh, you know, just a few of you being asked to do something and, and uh, thousands of miles away and then actually being expected to do it? And I, when I actually know that you can't imagine that here, because I know you're just about ready to send, what is it, your second team to Bolivia with your partnership with our Methodist brothers and sisters there. And I know that you have a strong presence in our community helping to teach children to read. I know that over the years this church has been very active both here in Edmond and around Oklahoma and around the world. I know that. And I am telling you what, do you know that the UCO Wesley Foundation that you support has gone from 30 some odd students to 150 students on a Thursday night, friends? Come on. Let's have some celebration here. It's not just me. Yeah. It's not just me. Prayer that is powerful is also effective. And we don't do it alone. We do it with the power of God in our lives and with brothers and sisters together. This is a lovely service, beautiful church, isn't it? Yeah. We sang together. I mean, that anthem from the choir. Whew. We shared the peace of Christ. We're getting ready to confess. Get ready. We're going to confess our sins. All right as we should, and once again and always, we are going to hear that the Lord God Almighty eagerly loves and lives in us and forgives us absolutely every sin. And friends, if that's all we did and had the benediction, in this lovely place, that would be enough. That would be enough. But there's a world outside these doors that God loves. And God yearns deeply for you and I to love God's world too. Enough to share our lives in such a way that we make a difference. So I invite you to pray, always. And may our prayers be powerful and effective. And my prayer for all of us today is that from those prayers, whatever they are, even the lists, even the to-do lists, from those prayers that our God 
will mightily and mercifully act through us, for us, and to us, and for all. May it be so. Amen.